Hi, I'm uh, Michael Haxby. Uh, you might know me as Michael Cayley. Uh, it's a funny story. Um, so basically, back when I started working on uh, soccer analytics seven, eight years ago, which is not a very long time to be working on something except for soccer analytics. There's like a small number of people who've been working on soccer analytics for longer than that, which is like really cool. And then like there's like basically everyone else. So um, anyway, I was at the time, I was an adjunct professor. I was uh, in the study of religion, which is highly related to soccer analytics. And um, I was like, okay, I'm starting to write. I'm, 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 I felt like there was a niche there for someone who did analytics, but also wrote, who, who could sort of try to combine the two and work more in the public uh, area. And so I started working on this, but I was like, I have the single most Googleable name of all time. Um, everyone who's named Michael with a K is uh, either is Swedish or Norwegian, basically, or me. And uh, um, so I had to change the name. Kaylee's my middle name. Originally, it was going to be Michael with a K. Kaylee, I actually did that for like about two hours on Twitter. And then I Googled Michael with a K, Kaylee, and the first hit was my dissertation. And I was like, oh, I, I guess that doesn't work. So um, that is how that happened. Anyway. So I, as I said, I've been doing uh, anal football analytics in the public sphere for a while. Um, I've done a little bit on the private side, but I think I've been always more interested in what kind of stories we can tell with data, the way that we can do a better job describing the game, making the game interesting, helping people understand better this game that they happen to care deeply, deeply about. And, and that's sort of, I think, with the way this talk ended up getting structured is that it is, it is more a way of looking at high pressing and looking at the way we can describe high pressing in different ways using different metrics. Um, so I, I wrote my, I, I was going back over the sort of bibliography and I found that I wrote my first article about pressing back in 2014. Um, I remember being very excited when Sidlow retweeted it. Um, and uh, so, and, and, and since then there's been so much work done by so many different people and I think that in particular, the StatsBomb data launch for the study of pressing can be this like huge leap forward. We already saw that in, in, in Peter's paper, starting to look at the values of pressing actions. Um, and I'm going to try to incorporate some of those ideas, try to open up so what, what I think the paths forward are. So, um, and one of the things that came up in this, I think that the, when we study pressing, what I found was there's so many different measures of pressing. And I think this is fitting. I think that in some ways this was just a function of the fact that we didn't have a measure of pressing. And so people just tried to use the event data to come up with a lot of different stories, a lot of different ways of measuring. But I think it ended up being quite fortuitous. Because when you try to understand what pressing is, you go into sort of reading what, what coaches have said about what other people have said about it, you get a bunch of different stories. And two of, the, two of the key ones here that I found sort of cover a lot of the ways people talk about it. Um, well, I'm going to start with the one on the bottom. Jurgen Klopp, uh, quite famously, you know, I'm on a football. No plain acre can be as good as a good counter-pressing situation. The idea that pressing is something you do that you are defending, but really you're attacking. You are seeking to win the ball in a space with the opposition out of shape so that the next player who's on the ball has space to make a good pass, even if they're not the best passer in the world. It's a way of creating attacking opportunities. And then this other quote from Arigo Saki, um, the manager looking at it from a very different perspective, quoted in, in the pyramid, saying pressing is not about running, it's not about working hard, it's about controlling space. This is the idea that what a press is, is limiting the space that the other team has to play in. And so it is about preventing their, them from getting into an attacking possession move that is uh, the kind of attacking possession move that they want to create. And you, make, you, you create less space by pressing up high, pressing your defensive line up high, and then it is much harder for them to achieve what they want to achieve. And these are two different stories of pressing, whether it is f primarily an attacking or a defensive action. These can be mixed in different ways. There's a bunch of different ways of looking at it. But I think that the important thing to think about is that when we're measuring pressing, we're measuring something that happens on the field. Teams push up and defend in high areas. But they're doing it for different purposes and within different systems. And so when we're measuring, we need to be thinking about what is this thing that we're measuring, because it, it is multiple, it is various, it is diverse. So speaking of multiple, various, and diverse, there's a lot of ways of measuring pressing. And, and as I was going through this, I found uh, two essays that were really helpful surveys of this, looking at a lot of different ways of thinking about pressing. I just wanted to mention very briefly, uh, James Warwick, it's, a, uh, it's, it's an undergraduate thesis, a master's thesis? Mm. 
Um, anyway, it's quite good. Efficacy of counterpressing as an offensive defensive philosophy. He goes and looks at a bunch of the, um, he, he, the, the core of it is his own data analysis of, of sort of his own track data in college uh, soccer, but there's a, there's a, which, which is fascinating in its own right, and then there's a, a good discussion of what's been done in the public sphere. Uh, Chuck Hey Ho, writing for American Soccer Analyst, which is an excellent site if you haven't uh, been, been, been following them. They, they do most of their work on MLS, um, but there's, there's, there's a lot of new work being done there, and he goes into a lot of different, different, different uh, ways of thinking about pressing, lays out a whole bunch of different possibilities. Um, but the five I want to talk about here and the five that I sort of, for this paper, created my own versions of, re recreated in the stats bomb data. Um, and a couple of these came up earlier. There's a PPDA by Colin Trainer. There's Moves Broke, which I called pressing because I, I like branding things. But I, I, if calling it pressing here would kind of, uh, you know, how do we measure pressing? Well, pressing by Michael Cayley. That's the best way. Um, it doesn't seem quite right. So I, I call it moves broken. Um, there's a, Paul, Paul Riley put together a, a center back zone passing. Will Gerpenard Morgan comes up. And then this high turnover is one, which I'm not going to get into too deeply, but I did want to mention this work that's being done, Anfield Index. They, they've got like a podcast. And they go back every week. They spend like an hour, hour and a half mapping every single pressing action that Liverpool make separating these out into different kinds and focusing in particular on winning high turnovers in dangerous areas. So I, I can't recreate their work in the data because it's their own data collection just on Liverpool matches, but I wanted to just mention it that it's out there and it's, it's, it's pretty cool. So what data am I using? Um, I've got uh, eight league seasons of data, three from 2017-18, Premier League, uh, La Liga, and Liga and uh, five from 2018-19, the big five, uh, La Liga, Premier League, Liga, Syria, and the Bundesliga. So uh, that provides um, just under 3,000 matches. And so you'll see as I'm going through this, you, when, when teams are listed, there will only be, um, for, for Italian and German teams, we're only going to have them listed in 2018-19. That's, that's what the data is. All right. So uh, this is passes per defensive action. Um, it is, it is, it's looking at, and this is a stat that was created, I think, back in 2014 by Colin Trainer. And this is looking for a way of measuring pressing that you can do with your sort of, you've got your data table, here's a way to combine it to make a measure of pressing. Which I think, I think things like that, which you, but people can just recreate, very valuable kind of analytics to do in the public sphere. And, um, or anyway, it's, it's valuable that people can recreate it and see it. And so it's pretty simple. It's opposition, open play, passes completed divided by attempted on-ball defensive actions. So when you're working in the Opta data, that means not just tackles, but also challenges, which is where someone attempts to tackle the ball and fails, um, interceptions and fouls. So it's not, just, it's not measuring just effective actions. It's not measuring just actions one. It's trying to look at moments when there's an individual action which is attempting to stop the, uh, the attacking possession play. Um, it's a way of measuring kind of high intensity. And then as you can see on this, as you see the yellow line down um, near midfield, what they, 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 use a they only look at 60% of the pitch. So you're back 40% that you're defending. It's not a high press to tackle the striker in the penalty area. That's not what we're measuring. So we're only looking at actions taken in what is a team's attacking 60% of the pitch, the other team's defensive 60% of the pitch. So... Um, and then, so what does this produce? I've got the, I'm going to have these charts for each of these stats. One of the things I was really interested in going through this are the ways that these differ. And the ways that these differ, I think what's important about this is not saying like, oh, this stat is making a mistake because it's, it, it's picking up this team as a high-pressing team. It's this stat is picking up this team as doing something in particular. And then if, it, if they show up across the board, we've got kind of like, OK, these are our clearest high-pressing teams. And the teams that show up a little bit there, a little bit here, we've got something different where we're finding out from putting these metrics together what their particular characteristics are. I know this is a little bit small, um, so I'm going to sort of pop off some of the, the top names of note. Um, if you were here for uh, the talk just before lunch, you were not surprised. And if you can see very well, you are not surprised to see Ibar at the top. Two of the four spots are Ibar. Uh, Manchester City is the other team that's going to show up uh, popping this metric um, over and over and over again. 
Some teams I think are interesting here, though, that we're going to be tracking a little bit as we go forward. Paris Saint-Germain come up very high, and Torino come very high in this passes per defensive action. They're making a lot of individual actions seeking to win the ball in ways that they don't show up in other numbers. Um, and there are some other teams. That, and, and, and one thing you might also notice here, if you are scanning it very briefly, we don't see any German teams up here. And the German press is not showing up as highly in passes per defensive action. I think it's really interesting. So holding on to that. Um, and then at the bottom, it's always uh, Nuremberg and Parma. Um, Nuremberg and Parma don't press. So th there's stuff to say about teams that don't press, I'm sure. But this paper is not one of the papers that does that. So another way of looking at this is what Paul Riley put together. It is uh, CB zone passing. Open play pass completion percentage from the traditional center back zones. So penalty area outside the penalty area, but penalty area extended uh, wide and not quite up to the halfway line. That's it. It is a surprisingly useful, uh, for, for a, a, again, very simple to produce from, uh, from, from, from data that you've got, a way of measuring whether teams are pressing. But it comes up with a slightly different set of groups. The teams that prevent uh, passes in this area are not necessarily the same teams that are making individual defensive actions in this area. Um, so some of them are. Manchester City, Ibar, boom. Um, but now Bayern Munich show up. Uh, Liverpool push up a little bit higher here. And uh, one of the teams that I find, found fascinating is going through this is Bournemouth from 1718 show up very high in this range. They seem to have been seeking to prevent, uh, prevent teams from playing out cleanly from the back, even while they weren't doing a lot of other kinds of pressing. And these are sort of things I'm going to be sort of pulling out as we go through these uh, charts. Um, I'm happy to go back to these as people have questions. So then this was uh, my metric, um, calling it opposition moves broken up. Um, so what this is is a little bit more complicated methodologically, a little bit harder to simply reproduce on your own. But this is what went into it. My concept was trying to look at not individual actions, but moves, trying to look at the way that pressing disrupts the opposition team's ability to string together actions, produce a possession or attacking move. So what I did was start with, opposi start with opposition attacking or possession moves begin that, that begin either in open play, from throw-ins, or from goal kicks or free kicks taken short. So I'm not looking at moves that begin with um, a long launched ball from a goal kick or something like that. Um, that you don't press that. You contest for the ball. That isn't how. Um, so I'm looking at, at only moves that begin with a, with a play that is seeking to retain possession. Thus, you're looking at times when teams are seeking to disrupt that possession. Um, for uh, categorizing moves, I remember um, back in the old days when we had to uh, take, our, take our data and string them together and use a bunch of complicated rule sets to say what an attacking move is. Um, Stassilon just does that, so um, that, that simplifies all of the processes. I just used their definition of moves, which is pretty similar to one that I used. Um, so it, 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 it leaves a bit of openness. It doesn't say that any opposition action, doesn't say that any time the opposition gets a foot in, knocks a ball away, um, that begins a new move. It requires the opposition to gain possession of the ball and do something with it before there can be a, a clear new possession, uh, uh, before a new possession starts. So th those moments, that were just, if you watch the first paper, those pinballing moments, those pinballing moments don't end a move. They can be part of a move. It's not until the other team gains possession rather than just knocking it around, that the move ends. And so I look at within these moves is how, in how many of these is, it, is, the un, op, is the opposing team unable to either first string together three completed passes in a row or make a successful attacking action. So you know, if a team completes two passes and then somebody shoots, like th they have not been pressed. Um, so uh, uh, defined attacking actions as a shot, a cross, a box entry, winning a corner or winning a free kick in the final third. These are contestable. Obviously, these are fuzzy. But it's a way of defining, OK, a team that presses, if the opposition either is able to maintain possession and, and, and string together some passes, or the opposition is able to get an, attacking, uh, get an attacking action off, then they have not been successfully pressed. 
otherwise they have been. And again, like uh, passive per defensive action, we're focusing on moves that begin in that back zone. All right, so what does this look like? So what happens here is a couple, the, the thing that is most notable to me is that suddenly Liverpool and especially RB Leipzig and Bayern Munich jump up this chart. So our previous charts of disrupting individual passes or winning um, or, 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 or making actions on the ball, we don't see these German presses. But now we've got Le Leipzig and Munich and we've got the German manager at Liverpool showing up much higher. So these are presses that where there, it seems to be what we find is that their goal is disrupting these moves. And, and that, that this disruption may not happen through defensive actions in the same way. Um, Marseille really popped this, uh, this, this metric, which I thought was interesting. It's Rudy Garcia's 17-18 uh, Marseille. And again, PSG, Barcelona, they're on the chart, but they're a little bit lower down. And we can also see one thing that I may pulling out in a couple other charts is Tottenham Hotspur. Um, we see them 17, the 17-18 Tottenham team is in, the middle, is in the middle of the high group on this chart. Um, this is out of 158 team league seasons, so I've got the top 25 and the bottom 10. So Tottenham Hotspur and 17-18 are in that top group, 18-19 they are not. Um, whereas, interestingly, Tottenham were two of the top teams in center back zone pass percentage. So we see a team that is pressing and preventing teams from completing out of that center back zone at a, at a high rate, but they're not translating that into breaking up moves at a very high rate. I think, I think there's some sorts of inefficiency there that I'm going to get able to get into. All right, and then another, an, another method, this was put together by Stats Bomb's Will Gerpenar Morgan, and he looked at modeling pass prevention. So if you put together an expected pass model, if you put together a model of how likely a pass is to be completed based on where it begins and where it ends, you can then say, okay, if we look at the passes that are attempted against this team, are they better, are, are other teams doing a worse job of completing them than we'd expect based on our model? If they're doing a worse job of completing them, we can think that must be, again, we're seeing the effects of a high press. We're seeing the effects of pressure in those zones. Um, so this is, I, I recreated his based on, um, uh, Will shared his code uh, pu publicly, which is a delightful thing to do. And I was able to work from there. I used a, a random forest method to create the model simply based on uh, a beginning and end of points of the pass. Very, very simple model. Um, passes, as he talked about, are under five yards or excluded in attempting to build this model. The problem is that passing a short pass is very easy. But sometimes if a pass gets logged as being a short pass because you didn't hit it right because it got deflected because you were under pressure. And the short passes are, um, they're, 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 they, they appear to be harder to a, to, to, to a model looking at football data than they actually are. So the simplest way to do it is simply exclude them. All right, so if we're looking at here, again, we've got the same top teams, Ibar, Manchester City. But, and, but again, we've got Bayern Munich and RB Leipzig here. So it appears that this modeled pass prevention metric is showing up something pretty similar to the moves broken up metric, which makes sense. If you're looking at every single pass in the action, again, in this back zone, if teams are doing a bad job of completing those passes, they're not going to be able to string those, uh, those moves together. So I think that my model and Will's model were measuring something relatively similar. Um, uh, but we get, to, um, and, and again, again, we're seeing uh, PSG and Barcelona a little bit lower on this metric. Um, and again, Tottenham Hotspur 17, 18, much higher than in 18, 19. So and I, I'm going to get to now a couple of these comparisons between these models I've been sort of, um, that I've been sort of previewing as I've been going through. But one thing I did want to touch on here is the high, high open play turnovers. This is, I think, our clearest simple model of what is a attacking press trying to do. This is when you gain a new open play possession in the opposition's back zone. This, these are the moments when you can attack. Um, and again, it's Ibar. Again, it's Manchester City. But we get some new teams up here which didn't pop the pressing metrics previously. Uh, Real Madrid in 17-18. Zidane's Madrid, one of the top teams in winning high turnovers. Napoli as well, Real Sociedad. Um, so I want to sort of hang on to those teams. I think it will be really, in when we get back into the pressures metric, we'll start to see something here. So our, our particular metric, just looking at whether a team wins high possession, whether they're able to uh, 
create situations where they start an open play possession in a dangerous area is giving us something quite different. Um, it's giving us Manchester City and Ibar, because of course, but it's giving us a really different set of teams from what we got for our more defensively focused models. When we looked at moves broken up, when we look at opposition pass completion relative to a model or just absolute, we got a different set of teams than we got when we were looking at high turnovers one. So we can start to see a metric that is really trying to measure a more attacking version of the press than the metric that was measuring the more defensive version of the press. So as I go through a couple of these, uh, these charts, uh, some of our teams to watch here, we've got Ibar and Metro City that are going to constantly be in that top or bottom corner, whichever is the, the, the place to be as a high pressing team. We've got RB Leipzig and Bayern Munich, and to a certain degree Liverpool, um, that seem to have highly efficient presses that are able to, um, to get a lot of defensive value out of not necessarily making as many pressuring and as many actions. Um, we've got the, the tactical changes at Chelsea and Tottenham. And we've got, I think the press inefficiency, I'm not, Barcelona's weird. Barcelona uh, uh, under Valverde, some, some really unusual numbers in the press. And I, I'm going to, highlight a couple of the others um, as we go through, and Parma is constantly going to be at the other corner just so you can see them down there. So th these charts are, again, not the easiest to read. I want to sort of like, tell you what we're seeing, which we're, we're seeing Manchester City. This is, this is modeling back zone pass prevention. So all of these next four charts are going to be modeled against the back zone, the, the modeled pass prevention. So Will's model of whether passes are successful. Um, and then each other chart is going to be the y-axis. This one is PPDA. Um, what we see here is, again, Ibar and Manchester City. But if you look at teams that are Leipzig and Bayern Munich, which have that very high modeled pass prevention, but are much more middling in PPDA, we can see that their, their ability to, to, to disrupt opposition actions without uh, making lots of defensive actions themselves. Um, we see teams like Torino and PSG making lots and lots of defensive actions. So low PPDA, as you think about it, that's fewer passes per defensive action. The lower PPDA, higher pressing. We've got Torino and PSG down lower as teams that are being very, very active, but not disrupting opposition possession quite as effectively. And then if we continue on here, um, looking at these, this is center back zone pass percentage. Again, Ibar, Manchester City, all the normal teams. Bayern Munich, um, again, highly effective at, uh, high, Bayern Munich, RB Leipzig, um, highly effective at preventing, uh, preventing passes, but they're not nearly as much trying to present them just in this particular zone. But know who is? AFC Bournemouth in 1718. Burnley showing up um, as, a, as having a relatively low completion percentage in this, in this region. So I think we're starting to see a certain kind of press that we see in effect at Bournemouth and at Burnley, that we see in effect at our super high pressing teams. But there's a way of preventing opposition pass completion without necessarily presenting, pr pressing these particular passes. And we see that in, in, in the German teams in particular. Here we have, um, again, the, my, my moves broken up model. And we're getting a, a similar set of teams up top. And again, this one, uh, some of the top teams, it's, it's, it's matching them much more clearly. RB Leipzig, Bayern Munich, very high in, 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 in breaking up moves and very high in um, back zone model pass prevention. My weirdos are uh, Marseille and Torino in particular. Those are teams that seem to be breaking up a lot of moves without necessarily making passing that much harder. I'm, I'm, I think this is sort of an interesting, when, when you have two models that are very similar and they, they, they disagree in a couple of places, these are places, I think, to further explore. All right, last one of these is high turnovers. This is where we get some, again, some of the same teams up there, Ibar, Bayern Munich in the top. Um, but we get some, 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 some particularly unusual ones. Uh, Barcelona, which has been showing up as a middling team in most of the defensive metrics of their pressing. Shop is one of the best teams at winning high turnovers. Uh, Napoli as well. Real Madrid, Real Sociedad. These are teams that are not necessarily pressing as high as a defensive metric. That when we attempt to measure pressing as something that happens um, in terms of opposition ineffectiveness, these teams don't pop those numbers. When we try to measure pressing in terms of where they are winning the ball in open play to start attacking, suddenly they show up. Um, 
And we can see that this is not what's going on with, Bornley and, with Bournemouth and Burnley. They are, while they are preventing passes in, in those areas for the center backs, it's not in order to gain the kind of attacking advantage some of the other teams are. Okay, so we've sort of surveyed these different methods, and we've looked at, um, we've found sort of where the gaps are between these methods and how these different methods identify different kinds of teams, identify different styles of pressing. Um, but this is where Statsbaum's data is, is just a, a huge leap forward. What, what if all of these other metrics have been attempting to find the outcomes of pressing? Because that was all you could do in the event data. Um, a, a press may lead, because you're, you're, you're pressuring the ball a lot, it may lead to a defensive action, but it doesn't have to. And then if you are pressing the ball, pressuring the ball effectively, that should lead to the opposition being unable to string passes together, being unable to complete passes at the same rate that we would expect. And if you are pressing well, you should be able to win turnovers in dangerous areas, start new possessions in good areas. But that is all sort of extrapolating from what we think the outcomes of pressing should be. What Statsbaum has done, as you know, is they started tracking pressures in particular. So the defensive player doing something, getting into the space the, the attacking player wants to occupy, making their action difficult, um, this is now measured as an event. Um, I've got the, the JSON up there that I got to know very, very well. Um, that's, that's what it looks like if, if you get the data and you've try to start working with it. Um, so who are the best teams? This, and to, to make it uh, an apples to apples comparison, is, is a pressure in their data can happen to multiple players. It can, it, you, you can, you, if you press someone, you might press them on their reception of the ball and press them while they are t carrying the ball a couple yards and press them on the next pass that they made. So in order to sort of like br bring that all down into one action, I just looked at passes pressured. Um, so that's what we have here. And here we see some interesting teams. Barcelona and Real Sociedad, sh which showed up as teams that were winning the ball up high, but not preventing opposition passes at super high rates, show up as some of the teams that press the opposition the most. Metro City and Ibar do too. Paris Saint-Germain, again, a team that had showed up as having a lot of defensive actions, show up here as also making lots of pressure actions. But they weren't winning the ball up as high and they weren't preventing the opposition from stringing passes together as well. So I think what we're starting to see is that pressures give us a somewhat different set of numbers. And then at the bottom here, two of the teams at the very bottom, when we're looking at the, all of the other metrics, we tended to see was teams that just concede space. Te teams that are your, your, your typical sort of bottom of the table sides that are going to um, your Parmas, your Nurnbergs, teams fighting to stay in the league. Um, we get two really good teams down here, um, at, 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 at Wolves as well. Actually, Wolves in 1819, Lazio in 1819, Chelsea in 1718. So solid upper half teams that show up as not making pressures in the back zone, um, which is a different effect that we're seeing just from the pressures data and not from other things, which I think gives us an insight into what those teams are doing as well. And then uh, Burnley. In 1718, I had mentioned as a team that was preventing passes in the center back zone, they also show up as a team that is doing a lot of pressuring the ball. So pressuring seems to be giving us more than I expected when I started to get into this data. I expected pressuring to give us something that mapped very cleanly to most of our existing pressing statistics. And to a certain degree, it does. I mean, Ibar. But to a certain degree, it really doesn't. It seems to be capturing something slightly different than the existing pressing stats did. I think we can see this in two of these charts. Um, so what, what, this now, the, 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 the bottom, the, the x-axis is the back zone passes pressed. So the x-axis now is stats bombs data. And I'm mapping it to two different things. First is the modeled pass prevention. And so you, one, one thing you can see here is just how extreme Barcelona in 1718 were. They are really off the charts in the number of passes that they were pressuring. And it looks like, and, and we can see um, Bayern Munich in 1819, Tottenham in 1718, RB Leipzig in 1819. These were teams that were not making as many pressuring actions, but still highly effective at preventing uh, the opposition from stringing passes together. And then down there at the on the left, you've got Lazio and Chelsea. 
who are making very few pressuring actions, but successfully about average at preventing opposition teams from passing through them. So it seems like we're starting to identify possibly a model of pressing, which isn't like a high press, but is an average-ish press that involves a lot fewer individuals making pressures of the ball on opposition players than they're trying to pass. Way, there must be ways that they are closing down space and preventing passing lanes without doing the active thing that is mapped as pressing in StatsBomb's data. Um, we see that Lazio and Chelsea, without doing hardly any pressuring of the ball, were just as effective as Bournemouth and Burnley at preventing opposition pass completion. It was just as effective a defensive press, it seems, with many fewer pressuring actions. So it's telling us something quite particular. But then when we look at, this is looking at high turnovers, suddenly these teams show up. Real Madrid, which has not been a team, Zidane's 17-18 Madrid, which hadn't shown up in any of the pass prevention metrics. So they are very high in back zone passes pressured, as well as very high in turnovers won. Real Sociedad in 17-18 as well. Um, Napoli to a certain degree. And I think what I, I have a hypothesis that what, one thing we're seeing here is we might be seeing something of that distinction. It's a, it's a, it's a schematic one. But we might be seeing something of the distinction between pressing and closing down. We might be seeing teams that are effective at individual closing down actions in dangerous areas of the pitch, which are aimed at winning possession, which are aimed at an attacking action, but which are not structured as part of a defensive uh, not, not, not part of a defensive structure aimed at preventing the other team from working in the space they want to work in. Zidane's Madrid show up as a really medium pressing team, and yet there they are making tons of pressuring actions and winning the ball high up the pitch. So it seems like pressure is actually giving us part, a different part of this story that we weren't getting from any of the other models. Okay, so what I want to focus on here, what I want to take away from this is the idea that we're seeing are different styles of pressing that are reflected in the different pressing metrics. So what we've, what, what, what all, what, I think it was sort of like a, what's the best way of putting that? I, th I think it was, it, it was really a very contingent thing that people ended up producing a bunch of very different metrics of pressing. I think it was pretty much contingent on the fact that you had to extrapolate it you had to figure out a way to code it. You had to figure out a way to multiply two spreadsheet columns together or whatever it was because it wasn't obvious in the on-ball data. And so people produced a bunch of different metrics. But this ended up being, fortuitously, it fit to the facts on the ground. It fit to the fact that pressing does happen in different ways. Teams do press with different purposes. And we can measure from when these metrics disagree we can identify teams are doing things in different ways. And pressures then adds to this. Pressures both, I think, is going to open up a whole bunch of new avenues to, uh, to, to, to new kinds of studies. But when we put it in conversation with just the pressing metrics, what we find is that it's identifying a somewhat different set of teams. It's identifying a, a somewhat different set of actions which are not necessarily correlated to that defensive press that defensive press, which is the main thing that our pressing metrics previously had identified. All right, so that is my sort of survey of it. I, I spent a bunch of time on that because I thought that ended up being some of the most interesting, descriptively interesting material. I wanted to flip over now to talking a little bit about something else that I think that these pressures metrics can do. Um, and in particular, when you're looking at the defensive side of um, of pressing, because all we had before were, for the most part, opposition actions, what we could do was measure how effective a press was defensively at breaking up the other team's actions. But once you have the pressures data, one thing you can do, one thing that I think was, was always, I tried a couple times, and ugh, always like basically impossible, was identifying players who were good at breaking presses, identifying players who were good under pressure. You ended up sort of end up having just really used dribble statistics, and there are just so few take-ons in a game. It is very hard to extrapolate from that. But now that we can identify which actions are pressured, we can start to really talk about actions under pressure and identify players who are good at that. Um, so I want to sort of look at some of the, the underlying background to this. So this goes to uh, the, the Jurgen Klopp 
quote from earlier about the press as itself a playmaker. And this is sort of looking at those high turnover numbers that we had before. Um, when you win the ball up high, this is the expected goals per attacking or possession move based on where an open play turnover was won. So open play turnover means that some, a new attacking move is able to start without a throw, without a free kick, or whatever um, in that zone of the pitch. Um, this includes XG not just from the shots taken in that move, but if the, the, if, if the move wins a free kick or a corner or a penalty, that's included as well. And um, the left side, and I, I thought this was fascinating. I was watching um, an earlier paper um, by Stefania, and pointed. she also had that left side as a place where more effective a attacking actions happen. And here, winning the ball on that left side, more effective for getting goals. Um, I think there's something to, I, I've seen this in a couple other things. My hypothesis is that you got more right-footed players, so they're moving in. They're, they're going to be able to um, do more dangerous things moving in on their right foot than um, you know, our fewer left-footed players moving in on their left foot. That might be it. I don't know. Um, so the press can be a playmaker. If you win the ball up high, you are creating dangerous situations. If you prevent that from happening, you're having an effective defensive action. And, if, and flip this around again. Not only is the press a playmaker, but the broken press can be a playmaker for the other team. And this is something you can see using the pressures data. Um, what I looked at here are shots and expected goals per possession or attacking move following the completion of three passes. So a press that has been broken with a successful possession move. And I, what I did was I, I, I separated this out into two sets. Um, one where, it, where that, those initial three, where in that initial three pass section, there's been a pressure in action. So this is where you have beaten a press. Someone has, has, has closed a player down at least once within that span of the first three passes. Um, separate that out from situations where the first three pa passes are not pressed. So think of um, you know, a, a team that is, not being, that is able to play out the back because the other team is going to be defending in a different zone. And, and then, so that is, that, that's what separates the two columns on the left. Um, from the two columns on the right. Um, and so the, the purple is shots per possession. The green is XG per possession. And then I separated these out again in terms of being the press and then making a direct move toward goal leading to the shot, or being the press and not making a direct move toward goal. And so what we get is that on that left side, that's a, you break the press and you make a direct move toward goal, that's going to lead to the highest number of shots per possession, leads to the highest rate of expected goals per possession. So when that press is broken in a way that allows you to move quickly forward, that is, again, a playmaker for the other team. So the, the press itself creates chances for you, but the press is also, as we would expect, something that, is, that, that bears risks. When you press and you can be broken through, that's going to lead to higher quality chances for the opposition. And then the way I think about this is we can flip this around again. So if pressing produces both attacking and defensive value, if pressing is a way of creating good opportunities for self to start an attacking move and it creates defensive value because when you stop the other team, um, because if you don't stop the other team, they can break against you in, in an effective way, in a way that leads to higher expected goals. Press breaking, pe press resisting must do the opposite. Press breaking and press resisting must be if an effective attacking and defensive strategy in direct relation to how pressing is. Um, there's a really excellent essay on the Statsbomb website by Grace Robertson about this, sort of looking at the theory of the press breaker, the history of the press breaker. Um, and the, the way she describes it is that is, is you have the old-time the old game control, the old-time deep-lying midfielder pinging passes all over the field. Suddenly, in the age of the press, they're unable to do what they had traditionally done. But that same role gets just sort of rebuilt around a new model of player. The controller was reborn now as a player who could dictate the game by withstanding opposition pressure and moving the ball forward nonetheless. So this is the kind of, this is the sort of thing that I think now Statsbomb's data allows us to start to try to estimate. So here's how I put the pieces together um, from a bunch of these different pieces. From, from moves broken up, 
I took, as I said, I'm looking at those, the, area, the time before a string of three consecutive passes is completed. So take that period of uncertain possession that I used in the moves broken up metric as a way of looking at how effective teams were defensively. So that's the period of play that we're going to be looking at is, is early possession, early possession before they've been clearly secured. Modeled pass completion, simple way of looking at how effective teams are at passing, how effective players are at passing in those situations is by using that pass completion model. So looking at pass success in these situations compared to what we would expect. And finally, from pressures, we can determine whether a move was pressed. Because if you look at passing in the first three moves, but you don't know if they were being pressured, you're just going to find teams, players on teams that aren't pressed. This is always what happens when you try to measure press breaking without stats bombs data, is you just end up with players who other teams didn't defend them because they didn't defend that team in that space. Um, with pressures now, we can identify. And what I want to be clear about this is that I'm not looking just one way you could do it. And, and be interesting, is to look at just passes that are pressed. Because the, the, the stats bomb data allows us to say this particular action was pressured. So you could look at just passes that are pressured. But one thing that I was sort of, I didn't want to lose here is the idea that one way of breaking a press isn't to pass under pressure. It is either to dribble past somebody, to get yourself open to make that pass, or it is to make yourself available to the player who's being pressed and then be able to make a good next pass. And I think that those are both effective skills in press breaking that wouldn't show up in just looking at passes that are themselves pressured. Getting the ball in a situation where you aren't pressured is kind of the best kind of press breaking. So that was what I wanted to focus on here. I want to see if the move is pressed, not if the individual player is pressed. So if in within those first three passes, there is an opposition pressure action. That's the set I want to be looking at. That's where I think we can identify this. And here's my chart. This is what came out of it. Um, what came out of it was goalkeepers. Um, if, if, you've ever done any, uh, if you've ever done any work on uh, expected passing, uh, goalkeepers come up like that. Um, but what I looked at then, um, separating those out, I wanted to look at midfielders. Look at, want, wanted to look at players who play in similar parts of the pitch. Um, Messi is on the list, which is our, always our best um, check that we didn't completely screw it up. And uh, I, I thought it was an interesting set of players. It's a lot of great passers. I think it's a lot of players who are great at passing and great at getting open. Santi Cazorla, Chess Fabric S, um, Marco Verratti. And then we've got a couple of, couple of weirdos. It's always, always fun. Um, in particular, some guys you'd think of as like not that interesting defensive midfielders. I give you Dale Stevens. Um, and uh, M Martin Darun of, of Atalanta shows up there as well. We've got a bunch of players who seem to be good at making that first action with, against, against a press. Um, so this was a, this is a first attempt. I tried to bring together some of the different pieces that we see in pressing and then flip them around, sort of fl flip around three of the different pressing metrics to try to find what it looks like when players effectively work against those. And that was what I came up with. I think this is, like a, this is a first step at a metric, but it's a kind of metric I've always wanted to work with. Um, and I, I just begged that Statsbaum uh, collect the data and, and give it to me from uh, the years that Musa Dembele was at Tottenham. Um, <laughs> please. All right. So what have we learned? Um, I, I want to say, I, I think models of pressing based on event data have not been invalidated by the Statsbaum data. That means the Statsbaum, in, in, in two ways, the Statsbaum data did not show that we were all like way off track. Identifying these actions where, where, where pressure happened did not take us to say, okay, we should like all that other stuff. That didn't work. It, what, instead, stats bomb pressures give us new tools to explore these models, better descriptions of team tax and tendencies, and in fact, I think a whole nother axis on which to study pressing. Because looking at pressuring seems to give us an angle into looking at, at pressing as an attacking action that we couldn't from the others. So part of this talk, I want to sort of fit the, all those pieces together and see the different uh, styles of pressing identified by the different metrics. I think the true breakthrough that Statsbaum's methods uh, will allow us, I, th I think we saw some of this in, in, in Peter's paper earlier, um, occur on the other side of the press. Because now that we know whether actions are under pressure, we can start to identify uh, and value press break in other kinds of on-ball actions in a way that we had not been able to previously without this data. So I think there's a couple of different, um, 
a couple of different ways and a couple of different um, ways forward using this data. I wanted to give sort of first analysis of what it does, how it fits with our existing knowledge, and thank you.